Hello and welcome to Why Dance Matters, a new podcast from the Royal Academy of Dance. I'm David Jays and I'm talking to people about the impact dance has on their lives. Inspiring, enlightening, even transformational. I'll be talking to dancers and non-dancers alike, but our first guest is ballet royalty from one of the world's great companies. Xander Parrish, whose journey took him from small classes in Hull to the Mariinsky Ballet in St. Petersburg, and who has a special place in the RAD's heart. The most glamorous and surreal interview I've ever done was with Xander, not long after he'd moved to St. Petersburg. He gave up a rare day off to show me around, talking as we went, including the famed Hermitage Museum. We settled in a room with very few visitors. The only exhibit was what looked like the world's hugest golden bird bath. As we talked, a Russian couple came in, and as they wandered around the bird bath, it was very big, their little daughter ran over and plumped herself down between Xander and me. She looked up inquiringly as we talked about Xander's early dance classes and his medal-winning ways in the RAD's flagship ballet competition and about treading water with the Royal Ballet until he was unexpectedly snapped up by the Mariinsky. I still remember that Xander seemed as surprised and delighted as anyone at the twist his career had taken. The little girl in the museum eventually skipped off as the dance talk continued. I hope you'll stick around to hear us now. So, Santa Parish, welcome to Why Dance Matters. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much, David. Before we start properly, could you just paint us a picture? Because famous theatres often really opulent, really elegant from the front, but the bits the audience doesn't see, not necessarily full glamour. Could you describe what it's like backstage at the Mariinsky? With pleasure. So really the Mariinsky is like a living and breathing museum. It's a magical place. There are a few theatres in the world that have the sort of atmosphere the Mariinsky has, where you go backstage and suddenly you're transported into another time. Maybe it's not always beautiful backstage, but it has its own special beauty. It's a unique and incredible place. I remember coming there for the very, very first time. I mean, this is 11 years ago already, when I first turned up in Petersburg and entered the stage door, I went backstage. And I was just transported into this different world. You know, you walk out onto the stage and and you look out into the uh, auditorium and you're greeted with this, with the glittering gold of everything in front of you. All the tiers are sort of painted gold and you've got the huge Tsar's box in front of you, the Duke's boxes on the sides, and they're all gold. So it's like, it's a very warm feeling. And all the chandeliers twinkling. It's a very warm and sparkly and beautiful place. It's, it's quite extraordinary. That's amazing. And do you feel that you're sort of surrounded by the ghosts of dancers past? Yeah, totally. There's a mirror on the ladies' side. We call stage left men's side and stage right women's side here at the Marinsky. I'm not really sure why. I think it's because the dressing rooms for the men are on the left and the women are on the right. On stage right, through the door, just outside the stage area, there's a huge mirror, a very old and mottled mirror, and it has uh, a big sort of gold frame. And apparently that was where Nijinsky used to check his costume before getting on stage, and it's the favourite mirror of various famous dancers. So it's... it's uh, quite a spe- special place to sort of stand and check your costume before going on stage you know i can imagine that's that must just be an extraordinary feeling yeah it is really i'm guessing slightly different to your very first encounters with ballet doing classes in hull your hometown how did ballet get its hooks into you there well, that would be my sister's fault. So I would, I would uh, squarely, squarely blame her for that one. So basically, I was into everything sporty. Cricket and tennis were my number one things, and football too, and anything except rugby, which I just detested. But then one day I saw my sister dancing on stage and turned to mum and I was 
I was like eight years old, I think. I was like, you know, why is Melzi on stage? I'm sat watching her. I was like, no, that's not fair. <laughs> that looks fun. <laughs> Little did I know. But um, <laughs> as though with that, my mum said, okay, well, you know, you want to go to ballet class too? You're welcome to. Literally on the next Monday, I went to ballet class with, with my sister. And it turned out on that very day, there was a, an audition for a um, whole new theater was staging the Pickwick Papers with Sir Harry Seacombe in the lead role. And they were looking for extras, kids to be various characters in this production. So I went to, the, I had, a, had a crack at doing an audition. I, did, I ran around, I think. And, but I was cast as a street urchin. <laughs> Can you oh, believe it? Perfect so, place to yeah, start. Exactly. So I got, you know, in the following weeks, we were working in the whole new theatre amongst all these sort of, you know, famous actors and stuff. And I thought it was just marvellous. I was running around backstage. There was, you know, plywood and wires and lights and then on stage it was all clean and proper and you were wearing you know ripped up costumes and makeup and it was just marvelous fun i was like this is ballet i was like absolutely i didn't know what ballet was at all i was running around the street version but i was having a marvelous time had you been a bit of a show-offy little kid or already or was this suddenly discovering a new side to yourself you know what bizarrely enough not at all i was actually a very shy kid I had a stutter. We, had, we used to have these uh, sort of drama classes at school. And it would come around to my turn, there'd be silence. I couldn't get the words out. It was awful. And so I was terrified of performing. But then it's strange. When I was doing sport or like when I was, you know, about to run up to do bowling at cricket or I was playing against someone in tennis, somehow I felt free. There was a freedom about performing, not with words, but with uh, physicality. And for me, when I was on the cricket pitch or on the tennis course or whatever I was doing, people were watching, you know, it was a performance somehow. And I sort of got that same feeling when I was doing this, this thing at the whole new theatre. My friends in my academic school in Hull had no idea I went to ballet class. Not because I was scared to tell them. I just wouldn't have thought about telling them. I used to finish academics and then leave school gates and walk down the road around the corner and go down, down the street to ballet class. But... No one knew. I never had any problems. And I didn't even know I was meant to be ashamed of being a ballet dancer, you know? <laughs> I didn't know I was supposed to be scared about it. So I didn't tell anybody. I wasn't hiding it. I just didn't tell anybody. There were three other boys in the ballet school with me who I'd meet up there with. They weren't in my academic school. And one of them is now principal dancer of ENB in London, which is uh, Joseph Cayley. Gosh, there was something in the water in Hull that yeah, produced was. <laughs> this generation of dancers. Yeah, there certainly was. Just whizzing forward a little bit, you went on to the Royal Ballet School. You did all your RAD exams with um, Frank Freeman, I think. So yes, I did. Well Frank done. was wonderful. Frank was a marvellous teacher for us because he was, I mean, White Lodge was an amazing place. I loved being at White Lodge. The teachers were super. We had brilliant teaching. It was very intense. But then on Saturday afternoon, we had Frank for, uh, for RAD. It was just, it was very different to what we were used to in the, during the week. He was much more relaxed with us. He was more uh, concentrating about dancing how we performed i mean he, he taught us all, all the rad exercises and combinations but he was much more concerned about how we executed them i really enjoyed that and he always encouraged us just to dance how we felt we should should dance and i thought that was wonderful i mean we had the obviously with the constraints of the exercises and we learned the combinations but he gave us great freedom to express ourselves within those combinations and i i really enjoyed that so what more feeling the performance than yeah, worrying just, about the technique that's how I remember it. Maybe I'm remembering of rose-coloured spectacles. I'm not sure. But I just, I just look back on it with great fondness. I remember those classes because back at that time, I wasn't one of the strongest dancers in my year by a long shot. I was actually towards the bottom of my class. We had 16 boys and I was probably ranked number 12 or something. So I was quite low down the rankings. When it came to Frank's classes, he always, I don't know, maybe he saw something in me, but he always encouraged me and let me dance and let me just be free. Oh, that's lovely. Cool. Yeah. And, and those RAD qualifications took you to the RAD's international ballet competition. Um, Absolutely. It's now called the Fontaine, but then it was the Gene. Yeah. You won a silver medal. It was held in Athens. And I think I've seen a photo of you dancing in front of what looks like the Acropolis. Can That's that be correct. true? correct. Absolutely. My first uh, Gene experience was in Birmingham at the Hippodrome. It was 2003. 
So that year I got to the finals, which was a shock. I wasn't expecting to get to the finals. But I got to the final. Uh, Joe, Joe Cayley, who was the guy who I'm talking about who came from Hull with me, he won silver or gold? I think he won a gold medal maybe. So Joe won that year, I think. I was so proud of him. And then the following summer, I tried again. And again, got to the final. And that, that year I won a silver medal. It was just the most wonderful experience. Lynn Wallace was teaching us and training us and she was in charge of, sort of helping our rehearsals and preparing us before the semifinals and finals. And she was really, really wonderful and really kind. Good. And so you came back to London with yeah. a silver medal in your pocket. <laughs> yeah. You, not long after that, I guess, got into the Royal Ballet. It must That's have right. felt like things were happening and then they kind of stopped for a while. What was going on, do you think? Well, any dancer's dream from Royal Ballet School wants to join the Royal Ballet. And so when I got offered the, the contract for the Royal Ballet, I was just like over the moon. I was just delighted, especially as I got offered it along with my sister. So we joined the company, young and full of you know hope and dreams to dance and use the previous eight years of training to go onto stage and dance. Of course, in a big company like the Royal Ballet, you join at the bottom and there's a long ladder to climb. <laughs> But it seemed that every, every rung I took up the ladder, it kept, the ladder kept getting longer somehow. I never sort of managed to get, get any higher. And so I got a bit stuck. It was a bit stagnant for me there. I learned many things. I had a wonderful time. The company was an amazing place to grow up. And to, you know, I, I formed friendships there and had experiences touring and going around the world, which was just amazing. I went on the tour to Cuba with Carlos Acosta and you know, when the robot went there and we went to his villa and stuff. It was just so amazing. I had a wonderful time. I, I love the Royal Ballet very much, the repertoire. But I was frustrated beyond belief dance, you know, performing the walk-on roles that I was doing. I was the rat catcher in Manon. I was the king in the Rake's Progress who literally sits and dribbles at the back of the stage for half an hour doing absolutely nothing. It was just the most... Yeah. It was very draining. I put in a lot of extra hours to try and improve and get noticed and nothing happened. As soon as I announced I was leaving, then I got a, a role. I was given the chance to dance the third cast of Lilac Fairy's Cavalier in The Sleeping Beauty. <laughs> like a month before I left the company, I was like, well, you know, now they give me a role. <laughs> yeah, in the performing arts, I guess you can only be as good as the opportunities you're given. Was that demoralising to have to cope with that, to know that there was more in the tank than was being asked for? Uh, yes, it was. But the fact was, I knew I wasn't a off-the-shelf ready dancer, I wasn't ready at that point to do big roles. So, of course, I wasn't cast for them. Dancers here joined the company from the school and immediately, immediately, they, when they join the company from the Vigana Academy, they are picked out who will be the future soloists of the company and they are given a coach immediately. And maybe they won't perform for a while. They'll do the quarter ballet work, but they'll be given a coach to work on solo roles with. And that coach will prepare them maybe for a year, maybe two years, maybe three years. They'll work on a role. And eventually, they'll try them out on stage. If they're not quite ready, go back to the coach and we'll keep going. They'll try them out again a bit later. And then bit by bit, they build the repertoire. And bit by bit, they gain experience and strength. And then suddenly, they find they're a soloist. So it is a bit of a surreal twist that you go from standing around the back of the stage at Covent Garden, sometimes dressed as a, an interesting kind of ballet animal, <laughs> to yeah. being at the Mariinsky dancing the ballet princes that you were clearly born to do how does how did that happen how did that come about so during my well i mean actually it boils back down to a i need to explain a little bit more so when when i was in the royal ballet and i hatched a marvelous plan uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's a, it's a funny one i thought okay so i'm i'm not dancing anything i'm doing all these walk on roles there was a catch-22. I was told by my director this, you know, I couldn't be promoted because I hadn't danced anything. But I couldn't dance anything important because I wasn't a soloist. So I thought, okay, catch-22 here. How do I get experience so I can dance something and then get promoted? But obviously, I can't get promoted until I dance something. So what can I do? So I hatched a marvellous plan. And I thought, right, I'm going to go to my boss and I'm going to say I want to go to Varna Ballet Competition in Bulgaria, a big, big famous competition which is known the world over. I was like, that'll get some attention. And, you know, she'll probably say no, but let's work on a role for you instead here. And we'll, you know, give you something meaty to try here instead. You know, keep you occupied. Just, you know, to my horror, she uh, said, OK, you can go to Varna. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> that wasn't the plan. <laughs> that was not that was not the plan. I was like, oh, my goodness. I've got to go to Varna now. 
I was like, okay, well, can I at least have a coach to help me prepare? I need to prepare eight variations for this competition. It's a big one. And fortunately, there were no coaches available. All the coaches were busy preparing the principles because there aren't that many coaches in the Royal Ballet. I found myself having to prepare for Varna by myself. Thankfully for me, out of the blue, a bolt of grace, this amazing um, dance from the company, Jose Martin, a Spanish first soloist of the company, came and found me out and said, Andrew, I heard about your situation. I'm thinking about becoming a teacher. I want to learn how to coach and I actually rather enjoy it. Can I coach you for this? I was like, yes, <laughs> yes, please. Wow. So Jose, bless his heart, took me under his wing for the following six months, every night and most days too, probably for three hours a day, two or three hours, we worked through a whole ton of variations and he taught me how to dance. He taught me Swan Lake, Giselle, Sleeping Beauty, um, Grand Pas Classique, Paquita, uh, La Fille Malgarde, the Cuban version. And then we had two contemporary solos to learn too. And so for, we made, made a plan and we drew out this graph by week, by day, by week, by month. And we worked through these solos. We just went all in. And every night we rehearsed these variations. And after six months, we held a, a performance in the Claw studio in the opera house invited all of our friends and you know, fellow dancers. And it was the most terrifying experience. <laughs> we performed, you know, all these variations in front of them in costume with a, a one-minute break in between each solo. I almost knackered myself. Because it was the most superb preparation and experience for me. And that's where I learned my craft, thanks to Jose. And to have that experience of giving a performance on a stage, even if it wasn't before the paying public, that must have been quite exciting. It was priceless. I mean, we're talking about my colleagues in the company. I mean, there was Tamar yeah. Rojo sat there. There was David Howard came to watch. I mean, all sorts of people. You know, Monica Mason herself was there. Most of the corps de ballet turned up. Oh my it, was, it was, yeah, it was intense. Anyway, it went all really well. I went off to Varna. I got cut after the first round and I cried my eyes out. I was just devastated. I thought oh, I'd so let, let that Jose down and I'd just, you know, embarrassed the company you know it was awful i just i thought why am i even a ballet dancer why am i doing this you know i, oh, I, I tried and then anyway get back to it i went back to royal went, went back to holding my spears and thought stuff it you know i've done what i can let's keep holding them spears <laughs> <laughs> someone has to hold the someone spears has to. i guess it's not, it's not a bad life I've got, I've got a good pension <laughs> i was like let's just, let's just keep paying that pension and hold them spears and see what happens <laughs> We had a guest teacher turn up in London, a Russian man who taught class at the Royal Ballet for two weeks, a young ballet master, apparently from the Marinsky, I wasn't really sure. I knew he was from somewhere in Russia, either Bolshoi or Marinsky. I just knew he was some Russian guy. And he was young, energetic, gave terrific class, was really inspirational. I loved his classes. They were really different to what I was used to. They were much more exciting, to be honest. And he gave me attention in class, and I found that really, really exciting. He saved two weeks on his last day. I was like, oh, he's going to leave. I was like, that's a pity. You know, I actually really enjoyed these, these two weeks of his classes. So I just well, sort of, you know, I was a bit naive. I sort of walked up to him. I was like, look, thank you for your classes. I've loved them. They've been wonderful fun. Before you go, can I show you a few more jumps? Maybe I can get a bit more, a few more tips from you before I, before I head off. Uh-huh. And he was like, yes, of course. You know, show me some soda basques. So we did some soda basques. And he was like, okay, show me some uh, manege. So I did the manege for him. He corrected it a few times and we tried it again. And he's like, hey, try double tour now. He kept going like this for like half an hour. <laughs> like I had, a, had like a half an hour masterclass with this guy. And it was just really great fun. And I was learning and it was, it was really, really inspiring. Anyway, he finished. He went back to Russia. I went back to my spear holding. Six months later, that same man became director of the Marinsky Ballet. And uh, yeah, exactly. And then through a colleague in the, in the Royal Ballet, he offered me chance to go to russia he gave this friend a message and said tell xander to come, come, come to russia come and see me come and you know, dance here if he wants to and i thought yeah. that's, not, that's just not even you know that doesn't make sense i mean because that is rare isn't it because the mariinsky does not really recruit dancers from the west that's not what they're about no <laughs> they, feel they have no need to really i mean <laughs> well there is that <laughs> so what was it about you do you think that he saw that made him think, yeah, this this chap would be a good addition? I'll tell you because because I asked him. I was you know I was like you know why me? I was like <laughs> I was holding spears at the back. I mean this guy from Hull. I mean of all places. Come on. I was like you know really Russia. And uh, he said you know 
I didn't I didn't offer you the job because you were the best dancer around, but because you wanted it, I could see you were hungry to learn. You were passionate. You liked my attitude. Simple as that. Right. Well, uh, thanks a lot. <laughs> so. Okay. And I wonder though, when you got to St Petersburg, and and as you say, you've been there for over a decade now. Yeah. If you're in an alien environment. Do you see yourself differently? Are there qualities in yourself that you hadn't recognised in your familiar, safe home environment? Hmm, that's a good question. It's hard to answer because you change yourself so so slowly, you don't notice. I think people themselves don't see. Maybe others would see, looking at you from outside. But for myself, it's hard to tell. I'm sure I've changed a lot. I've grown, I've learned, I've grown up. I've danced roles I've never even dreamed I could possibly tackle. Sometimes it's, it's a slow climb but then you look down and you're like oh my goodness you suddenly realize how far you've come because you must have learned so much just because of all the different skills and demands of those very exacting roles that you've taken on i mean for example partnering leading ballerinas was i Mm. guess something you never had a chance to do until you got to one of the great companies in, in yeah. the world in Russia. <laughs> exactly. I mean, when I was in my first year in Royal Ballet, I remember one of my first roles in my very first season was a candelabra holder in Marguerite Marmont. I was wearing a green coat and I think a gray, a gray wig, and I was holding the candelabra. I was watching Sylvie Guillaume and Nicolas Lariche dancing in front of me. And Sylvie's foot almost grazed past my nose as it went through a car- <laughs> through, through, through a carte in, in the last in the diagonal in, in the in the first red scene, and I remember thinking, "Wow, you know." And then fast forward, must have been ten years later, and then I was doing that exact same thing, but partnering La Pacana. I mean, I couldn't even have, have, have dreamt about that. But then it's just uh, you know some things you look back and like, how, "How did that happen?" <laughs> yeah. <laughs> talked before about being sort of shy off stage but to an extent coming to life as soon as you were performing yeah did you have any nerves and qualms when you first had to take the stage at the Marinsky in a leading role it was easier at the beginning to be honest when I first turned up here I was nobody I had no qualification to be here I was a nobody <laughs> from nowhere basically in their eyes I mean, yeah, sure, I came from the Royal Ballet, but that, what, what does that mean? I was the guy holding the spears. I wasn't like a famous dancer coming here who had a following or anything. And I had, it was liberating. I felt absolutely free. There was no pressure. I mean, yeah, of course, there, was, there were pressures, but I just, I had no, nothing to lose. And there's something about that position of having nothing to lose that makes it very easy. And so I went for it. And by God's grace, I succeeded and did some good shows. And I got eventually experience here and promotion. When I got promoted eventually, and even especially when I got made principal, it was a lot harder. By then, people knew who I was. They were, especially from the, from the West, not so much from Russia. Some from Russia, of course, but they were, you know, the critics. I'm not talking about professional critics. I'm talking about, you know, critical people, usually keyboard warriors who like to express their views who have absolutely no idea of what you've ever come to get to where you are, but they feel the, the right to put you in your place, which is quite amazing, to be honest. Mm-hmm. That was a lot harder. You have to put that to one side and ignore it and do your work. And just because you're a principal, it sounds as if you're not going to get easy in terms of what's expected of you in terms of rehearsal and uh, the roles that are thrown at you. You're not just swanning in oh, in the evening way. in a silk dressing gown with a cigarette holder. <laughs> um, you're... That sounds marvellous. Actually, 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 you put it in my contract. That sounds absolutely fantastic. <laughs> That's the rider. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but you're, yeah, I mean, these are full on days and big roles get thrown at you at very short notice. Yes. Yeah. Very short notice. <laughs> if I get five days to repair Swan Lake, that's amazing. Usually I get three or four. I say days. I mean, I'm talking about rehearsals. So I'll have maybe an hour and a half on each of those days with the girl and maybe half an hour with my coach. So talking about, you know, a few hours to put together a big ballet and then perform it. Wow. And I got told a few days ago I'm dancing the Bronze Horseman in literally two weeks' time. Well, from now, it's already 10 days from now or something. I mean, I've managed to learn probably about 70% of the ballet 
but I haven't really rehearsed it that much and there's still big chunks I'd have no idea what to do. <laughs> I've got a lot more to learn. <laughs> and um, you know, studying the videos and trying to learn at the same time performing. I had a show last night, I've got a show in a few days' time. I've got to juggle those things at the same time as learning the new repertoire and keep the partners happy who I'm partnering uh, and the coaches of those partners. And, you know, there's a lot to juggle. To me, Xander, that sounds utterly terrifying. You're sounding quite calm about it. <laughs> Are you just now used to knowing that you can get stuff into your body in time for the, the curtain going up? Well, that's the beauty of experience. I mean, now I'm quite experienced now. I'm in the second half of my career in terms of classical stage dancing and sure. I've danced a lot of shows these past 10 years and particularly the past seven years I've done a lot of big big roles and so I kind of learned how to handle this I mean yeah there's still going to be difficulties it's still still stretch overcome and there's there's going to be a lot going on but the fact is the show's going to happen whatever we're, we're, we're the way out you so you might as well just go and have a go and see what happens <laughs> and you're in Russia we hear a lot about the country in the news and mm -hmm. Let's be honest, it's it's often not good um, when, when we hear about it here in the West. What's it like living and working as a Brit in today's Russia? Well, to be perfectly honest, yeah. The, the, I mean, yes, I, I follow the news too, of course, and it's often not, not uh, always encouraging. The fact is, it's, one needs to separate um, you know, government politics from people. The Russian people themselves are actually really wonderful people. They're very friendly. They're very artistic people. Russians have a lot of respect for arts and culture. So ballet naturally fits here wonderfully. And it's highly respected. And people are intelligent. They're kind. It doesn't really fit the picture of what, what you see in the Bond films, you know? I mean, <laughs> that, that's, that's all I knew before I came here. So, But yeah. you know, the Russian people are wonderful people. And we certainly have a lot more in common with them than we realize. Russia itself, as politics aside, is a, is a terrific place. I mean, you've been here yourself, you know how gorgeous it is, what a wonderful place it is. I mean, Hull and London will always feel you know, like special places in my heart. And of course, you know, home is always home. My family's there, you know. But I come here now, I get on the plane, I fly over here, get off. I know I've got my Yandex taxi app. I can talk to a taxi driver. I can speak some Russian now. So it's it's all pretty comfortable. I know where I'm going. and I know the city inside out. And I've got my friends and my theatre here now. I very much feel at home in St. Petersburg and I, I love it here very much. And what I remember as well about going round with you in St. Petersburg was whenever someone asked what you did and you told them that you mm. were a dancer with the Mariinsky, they were thrilled from, yeah. you know, museum guards people in yeah. cafes there was a genuine excitement yeah <laughs> yeah it's true it's held in great respect here and that's, that's that's a really nice thing i mean also just in the media i mean you turn on tv here and you're very likely just to bump into some ballet or some opera or some concerts if you turn on the tv here regularly broadcast you know full length right. productions and arts events and it's held in great respect and it's in the it's in the psyche here which is wonderful really I'm sure there are many young dancers all over the world who could relate to your situation about a dozen years ago, mm. not feeling able to shine, feeling that they've got more to give. What would you say to them? I would say never give up. Dance for yourself. Enjoy what you do. If you have a passion for what you're doing, if you have a hunger to learn and grow and to conquer your art, you will. But it's up to you. You have to not give up. Sometimes last man standing. So just don't give up. And sometimes the chances will find you. If you're, if you're working hard and doing your best and having that good attitude that, you know, that uh, Yuri saw in me, it's just, I wasn't even thinking about it. I was just wanting to learn. Simple as that. Like a magnet, he just came over to me. And that turned out for my good. Bear that in mind and uh, believe that it will work out for your good. Sander, I'm going to let you go because probably it, during the course of this conversation, you've been <laughs> cast in two more huge ballets <laughs> in a couple of weeks' time. Quite likely. <laughs> so a couple I will of weeks. That's an, that'd be great. I think probably a more likely. <laughs> <laughs> so 
so I will stop, I promise. <laughs> but before I let you go, just one last question, which of is course. the big one. In It's in the, the title of the podcast. <laughs> so Xander, why does dance matter to you? <laughs> dance matters to me because it's an expression of the heart. It's an expression of the person. Dance can't be separated, in my opinion, from the person doing it. It's an expression of the person who's performing. Sometimes you'll come across teachers or choreographers who seem to think that ballet is just a physical thing and to be trained and beaten into a student and they should do exactly how they say. But I disagree. I think ballet is an expression of the person doing it. It has to be interpreted through the filter of the person who's feeling it and performing it. And therefore, for me, it matters because it's an expression of who I am. I dance not just to execute the steps exactly how they were created a hundred years ago, you know? To be honest, I don't really care about that. I respect it. I know it's important, but I think every dancer is a, a different living, breathing organism of, of individuality. And everyone should have a slightly different take and feel and, you know, effect on the, on the thing they're performing and dancing. And so for me, it's important because, again, I, as I say, I think it's a reflection of the person who's doing it. And that's a chance for me to express myself. That is very lovely. Thank you so much. And thank you, Sander, for giving up your time at the end of a long, hard day's <laughs> rehearsal. For you, David, it's a pleasure, me. always. RAD is, uh, holds a special place in my heart. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. I get the shivers when I think about how lives can change in an instant. What if Sander hadn't been spotted by a Mariinsky coach? What if he'd resisted a new life in Russia? Would his talent have still found its way through? Would dance eventually have stopped mattering to him? I'm glad it wasn't put to the test. And how about you? Does Xander's story resonate with you? Let me know at Mr David J's on Twitter. The RAD is at RAD headquarters and you can explore its work via our show notes. And please do subscribe and like the podcast so that it makes its way to other people who might enjoy Why Dance Matters. Our guest today was Xander Parrish. Why Dance Matters is made by the RAD team of Hayley Izzard, Celia Moran and Melanie Murphy. Our artwork is by Bex Glendinning and our producer is Sarah Miles. I'm David Jays. Take care and see you soon.